Good evening, everybody. We left off on page 365. Chapter 13 Al Rahman, Porter, Hanrick, and Norman left first. They were escorted to the base through the opening the SEALs had created in the safest area, which was a cargo hold. Kirby and Kiri were left standing in the tiny hallway, awaiting the signal to board the lockout trunk and leave the submersible. As she leaned against the hallway, Kiri could see the holographic display on the command center's table. The SEAL's sensors were filling in information as they infiltrated the base, and their transmissions were sending a 3D layout of the base to the display table. Lyle was staring at it, trying to gain any knowledge that he might use to guide the teams from the submersible. Kiri was happy to see the signature red dots that meant life signs of enemies. This kind of information would make their lives a lot easier. After what seemed like an eternity of waiting, they received the signal. Let's do this thing, Kirby said, and stepped inside the lockout trunk. Kiri put her oxygen supply back in her mouth and pulled her mask down. The trunk filled with water, and eventually the exterior door opened. Waterproof weapon in hand, Kiri swam out, followed by Kirby. They were met by a man who was most probably a seal. He gestured for them to follow him, and led them the short distance to the base. Kiri's heart was beating rapidly. The base loomed in her peripheral vision as they swam further from the safety of the submersible and closer to the hulking underwater mass of domes. Her mind was reeling with questions of how Smith had accumulated the funds to construct such a structure, or how anything, even tank sails, could support it. They were led through a tube recently installed in the, in, in the side of one of the domes. Kiri could see the watertight seal the seals had made a, around the tube, and had only moments to think about this before she was shoved into the coffin-sized tube and her surroundings dissolved from the murky depths of the Atlantic to absolute darkness. If it was possible, her heart rate increased. Then she felt the water draining from around her, and someone pulled her through by her oxygen tank straps. She scrambled to her feet on the other side and removed her oxygen supply from her, from her mouth. She looked around, seeing they were in the cargo bay now secured by two Navy SEALs. Step back from the opening, she was ordered, and she did so, nearly slipping on the floor as she and her gear formed a puddle beneath her. She didn't ask if they were going to get a chance to dry off. She already knew the answer to that. Kirby was yanked through after another moment, but he seemed far less flustered than Kiri. He stripped himself of his scuba gear and checked his weapon. He looked to Kiri, who had only just rid herself of the heavy gear. Are you ready? he demanded. She nodded once and he led the way out of the cargo bay. One of the seals at the door handed him an electronic writing pad. He pointed to the layout. You'll rendezvous with Al Rahman and Han Rakir. Once they've located Smith, you'll pursue her, and your mission will be to gain access to her and keep her where she is until we can get a clear shot for a tranquilizer. Kirby tucked the pad in his soaking wet supply belt and nodded, then indicated that Kiri should follow him. The lieutenant decided not to ask why, if the SEALs expected Kirby and her to find Smith, they didn't just have the two of them tranquilize her. Or why, if they were able to keep Smith where she was, the SEALs couldn't do it themselves. Perhaps they thought Smith would only stay put to speak to Kiri. Regardless of the answer, the CSI lieutenant knew these people had been planning this in her absence, and at levels far above her pay grade. She was along for their ride. They silently walked down the hallway, hugging the wall in case anything went wrong. They encountered no resistance, but did see several bodies on their way through the deep blue and chrome-decorated hallways of the futuristic base. Then Kirby slipped into an alcove, so quickly that Kiri nearly missed it. A few seconds later, the back wall opened, revealing a server room with Al Rahman and Hanrick at the center. One seal stood guard outside, and Kiri supposed that the rest were somehow out of sight. She's here, Al Rahman said handing her electronic map to Kirby. Kirby studied it, then handed it to Kiri. Got it. O'Malley, you know what you're going to say? Kiri nodded. I've been going over it in my head, she told him. It'd be best if I appear to be alone. Kirby nodded. Okay, we'll hang back, but we're surve surveilling you. Unzip your shirt. Kiri complied, revealing a lightweight bulletproof-slash-energy-blast-proof vest under the special ops wetsuit. The vest too, Kirby said, and pulled a small device from a watertight pouch on his supply belt. This needs skin contact. 
She proceeded to partially unsnap the vest, and then Kirby placed the small device up against her collarbone. That'll let us track you, your life signs, and your surroundings, he explained. Kiri felt it sting her, and, when, and then when she rubbed the area where it was, she noticed it had actually sunk into her skin. The question of how she would get the thing out was right on her tongue, but she didn't ask it. When she was finished re-zipping the vest and wetsuit, Kirby asked her, You all set? His eyes probed her expression. She took a deep breath and nodded. We'll move in if we see anything's wrong. We'll be right behind you, but maintain enough distance to make it look convincing. The seals will be there too, just out of sight. If you're having second thoughts about this... I'm not, and if Smith rigged this place to explode, we're losing time. I need to leave. Now. It might have been her imagination, but she thought Kirby nearly smiled at that statement. He nodded once, and said, Okay. He slapped her on the shoulder. Good luck, and Godspeed. We'll be right behind you. Smiling slightly, she checked her weapon, looked at the map again, and left the server area. Map in one hand, weapon in the other. She moved through the base. She traveled for about five minutes in complete solitude, the sleek, spotless corridors ahead of her devoid of all life. But then she spotted a body and was almost relieved. It was the first confirmation that this area had been cleared by the seals. She snatched the security badge off the body just in case it might come in handy and kept moving. She was only a few hundred feet away from the location Al Rahman had identified as Smith's office. Suddenly, the intruder alert alarm sounded loudly. Damn, she thought angrily. They were doing so well. She had no idea what had gone wrong, but didn't stop to think about it. She just ran. If she was going to get Smith without being knocked off her feet by an energy blast or by gunfire, she would have to hurry. Stay calm and focused, a voice came over her radio. We've still got you backed up, O'Malley. Stop running. Heart pounding. Body filled with adrenaline, she had to force herself to slow down. She was at a junction where the white, spotless corridor met a curved, shiny black hallway. Two guards emerged from the junction suddenly, and she raised her weapon to fire when they both dropped. She heard the echo of the rounds responsible for their deaths, and spun to see who had fired, but the seal was already out of sight. Keep moving. Smith is still in that office, her radio ordered her. Roger, she said, and steeled her nerves. She continued walking, and stopped just around the corner from the office where Smith supposedly was. She pocketed the electronic map and took a brief look around the corner at what kind of security Smith's office had. It was keypad accessed, complete with a retina scan and two guards. Kiri could handle the guards, but the rest of the systems? She took another brief look just as the lights went out, and the intruder alert alarm stopped blaring. Thank God for Navy Seals, she thought with a smile, and rounded the corner. Two shots landed the surprised guards on their backs, and Kiri quickly studied the security systems. The lights were out on them too, so Kiri assumed that the Seals, or Al Rahman, had found a way to bypass all power in the building. The door should slide right open, Kiri thought. She pushed it, and it swished open gracefully, revealing a desk and the back of a chair in the middle of a wood-paneled room. Kiri scanned her surroundings in a practiced manner, just as she scanned every building as she entered for police raids. The wall she faced did not look solid up close. She quickly backed away and moved to a better position, and was shocked when the tall form of Taylor Smith confidently strode out. She had long brown hair that was graying slightly, and she wore a black turtleneck tucked into black cargo pants. Her boots had small heels, and if one saw her from behind, one would have guessed that she was ten years younger. Her face betrayed her years, and the dark circles under her eyes betrayed that she hadn't gotten any sleep lately. She didn't look to be armed, but Kiri didn't believe that for a second. Lieutenant Kiri O'Malley, Smith said, as if each word belonged to its own sentence. I've been expecting you for quite some time, she said arrogantly, and smiled. Kiri held her weapon at the woman's head, and said nothing as Smith stood still before her. "'Excuse my poor manners, Lieutenant. Please, have a seat,' she gestured at the guest chair on the other end of the desk. Kiri's weapon didn't waver. "'You're under arrest, Smith,' was all she could bring herself to say. 
She didn't anticipate the rage building up in her chest at the mere sight of the woman who had nearly taken her husband's life. She said a silent prayer that God would calm her rage and allow her to think clearly in the face of evil. Have it your way. Can I get you coffee? Anything to drink? Smith asked and nodded toward a coffee machine in the corner. It was then that Kiri noticed, out of her peripheral vision, that there were several choice machines lining the wall. She filed that information away for later, and managed to demand, Get down on your knees and put your hands behind your head. Not quite yet, Smith said. She could see the smile forming on her face did not match her eyes. Those eyes. She had stared into them before, twelve years ago in Smith's bedroom. They were emotionless. Gray in color, pupils smaller than Kiri had ever seen before. She looked almost as if she was on drugs, but Kiri knew that wasn't the case. The competence she showed was of a higher level than most scientists working for the space program. Kiri didn't bother asking her why she wasn't concerned with the fact that the U.S. Navy SEALs had taken out the vast majority of her fighting force. She had a fair idea, and she understood that there wasn't much time. Lieutenant, may I ask you a question? And please, do put that damn thing down. It's starting to annoy me. Kiri didn't move a muscle. Ask your question, she said, not sure when would be a good time to start her little prepared speech. She did remember that she was supposed to stall Smith until the SEALs could tranquilize the crime boss, so she figured letting the woman gloat might just be in their favor. How would you describe the feelings you had when you knew that Connor had a 36.87% chance, chance of surviving? She paused, seemingly searching Kiri's face. Or didn't you discover that? Kiri didn't answer. She forced her body not to go numb at the question, but to put it out of her head and concentrate on Smith. I suppose you didn't, Smith said, and glanced around her office casually. Not many people have the ability to mentally calculate probability down to two decimal points. Anyway, I digress. We're not here to talk about Connor, are we? She folded her arms and waited for the answer that wasn't coming. For someone who always seems to know what to say, you're surprisingly quiet. Fine, I'll talk, Kiri said, her weapon still pointed directly at Smith's head. She had thought about what she would say to her, but what came out was not what she had planned at all. Let's talk about you. You've got some hard feelings, obviously, and so I decided to come here and work them out with you. Smith was making eye contact now. Over a decade ago, you gave me a clue, and you've never been able to get over what that mistake did to your family. You led one rookie bomb squad member to your bedroom. You were so hard to trace that it took a year to get to you, and your own mistake, not our genius, was what finally brought us there. And when we arrived, Thomas had been born. Smith's face finally showed some rage. It was slight, but it was there. This was where Kiri wanted to go. Your beautiful baby boy and his father were perfectly safe in your house until we showed up. And it was me, Smith, who wrecked it all. I fired the shot. And because of my performance, I was allowed to oversee the child's custody. I ordered him to be moved every few years to make it impossible for you to plan anything we couldn't avert. I kept him hidden from you, deprived you of 11 years of his life. Smith's hand was hovering, shakily, over her cargo pocket. Perfect. And so you decided to solve the problem by going to the source. You decided to eliminate me, but not before you caused me the same pain I caused you. Isn't that right, Taylor? There was a pause, a twitch at the sound of her first name coming from her enemy's mouth. Then she pursed her lips and shook her head. You're not worth it, she said simply, and smiled. The smile turned into a chuckle, an oddly regretful chuckle. Oh, Mally, you idiot. Smith pulled an electronic pad out of her cargo pocket, and Kiri almost shot her for it, but the taller woman simply shook her head. And she pressed a button, no and a horrible noise sounded in Kiri's ear. The lieutenant tore the radio out and let it fall by her shoulder as she cried out in temporary agony. Crap, Kiri thought, and her instinct instincts told her to shoot the woman right there. Smith didn't give her a chance to act. 
I let you in, she said simply. She folded her arms again and stared smugly at the lieutenant. Why do you think I left you all those clues? I know you won't trust me, O'Malley, so open the desk drawer yourself. Go ahead. Do it. Kiri paused, raised an eyebrow, and stepped back away from the desk. You open it, she said, convinced the desk drawer would explode. If you're worried about a bomb, you must realize that any explosive device I could have planted would affect me as much as it would you at this range. But Smith didn't wait for Kiri's action. She merely rolled her eyes as if she was bored and pressed a button on the electronic pad. The drawer popped open by itself. Look, Smith directed. Kiri kept her weapon trained on Smith, but did a quick cursory glance at the drawer. An old USB drive. So what? She asked impatiently, but she remembered that Kyle Warren was in possession of a similarly old and rare memory device. It's got your choices on it. Kiri squinted in disbelief. Pick it up, plug it into a reader, and look for yourself, if you manage to get off the base. How much time is left on the countdown, Kiri demanded, assuming Smith wouldn't pass up the chance to tell Kiri about her slim chances of survival, given her earlier reference to Connor's statistical chances. You have at least four minutes, an eternity, but you won't be able to get me out of here in that time. So make a choice, Lieutenant. Either take the USB drive and the DNA vials, she said, and Kiri raised an eyebrow in inquiry, or haul me in, but you can't have both. What are you talking about? What DNA vials? She pressed another button, and the file drawer near the choice machines popped open, revealing about 50 test tubes. Now, if you don't mind, I'm about to get very uncooperative. We'll speak soon, I'm sure, she said, and pressed another button on the electronic pad. That's when energy weapons that should have been disabled suddenly emerged from the walls. Kiri dove behind the desk, and they opened fire. We'll read more tomorrow.